Political violence in the world's trouble spots can be a very personal experience, and someone who goes through that could be expected to stop communicating and stop caring. Next on Global Perspectives, we'll talk to someone who had every reason to take that route and hasn't. I did not want to give up on, on, on dialogue, you know, and that has saved me. This program is made possible in part by funding from the UCF Global Perspectives Office, the Global Connections Foundation, and the India Program at UCF. This is Global Perspectives with Pulitzer Prize winning commentator John Bercia, Special Assistant to the President for Global Perspectives at the University of Central Florida. Hello and welcome to the Global Perspectives show. In the aftermath of 9-11, journalists from all over the world traveled to Afghanistan and Pakistan looking into the activities of extremist groups, notably the Taliban and Al-Qaeda. One of those journalists was Daniel Pearl, already in Pakistan on assignment from the Wall Street Journal. He was kidnapped on the way to what he thought was an interview. Nine days later, his captors killed him. Today's guest is his widow, Marianne Pearl, who was also a journalist. She was left alone and pregnant after Daniel's murder. Her memoir, A Mighty Heart, was adapted into a film starring Angelina Jolie. Her second book, In Search of Hope, is a collection of women's profiles from around the world based on her global diary column in Glamour magazine. In these profiles, Pearl explores how women's courage and accomplishments inspire hope. Welcome to the show. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you for having me. Tell us a little bit about your journey. So many of us know some of the details, but maybe take us back to, to when all of this started and uh, your, your, your response to it and your decision to, to write these two books we've referenced. Well, uh, when Danny was killed, I was with him in Pakistan and I was pregnant. So the first thing I did is give birth <laughs> and uh, went back to Paris. And, um, but I think that for me, uh, one thing I, I wasn't was uh, confused on what I had to do. I mean, it was, I was uh, um, very clear. I think I had a very uh, intimate understanding of what the purpose of, of the killers was and also what the purpose of terrorism was because, you know, that's three months after 9-11. And I had to make a decision on why, how do I react to this. And I think Danny and I uh, came together as very much a global couple. It was, a, some, uh, it was an explicit way of life, and it was a decision that we had, that we had made of um, you know, wanting to be at home in the world and wanting to bring the world home and having this, uh, this approach. So I really knew that um, you know, one of the, 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 the purposes of, of, uh, of terrorists was to, to kill that instinct of, of reaching out. And I decided that I was not going to do that um, to honor Danny, also to honor our commitment, and because also we had a son. And I was very much determined that our son was going to be free uh, of that sort of hatred that you know, they were trying to promote. So after that, my journey really illustrates that. I didn't know what that meant. You know, it, was, it was just a conviction, but I didn't know what that meant. And so the first thing I did, uh, um, was to actually go and talk to the different leaders uh, that I uh, needed to talk to because, you know, it was also a situation that was very linked to terrorism. I, I had uh, participated in, uh, in, um, in, the, in the search for Danny, and so I, I was very much um, in contact with a lot of different agencies and police agencies and all that. And, and I had seen a ground reality that I thought was not uh, related, uh, you know, related in the media. And, uh, and I wanted to convey that to them, you know. And I wanted to say, well, you know, you, you're making all these decisions, but do you know what it looks like out there? And so I just went for that. I just went to tell them, uh, this is what I saw. This is how he, you know, this is who did it. Uh, I'm talking about the, you know, the, mm -hmm. the, the police forces and all that. And, um, and just give them kind of, of an, a human account, you know, a real, you know, real life account of what, what's really going on in the ground, which was, I thought was, was valuable because they actually had no idea. Mm -hmm. And so after that, um, but what was the most important thing you, you you found on the ground that you that you shared? You know, for me, John was was um, uh, in my experience. I was all of a sudden. At first, I was surrounded by police agencies mm. and the FBI and and whatever the ISI and you know, all these different uh, groups and organizations, and everybody was fighting each other. And these people didn't talk. 
But because they were around me and in the house and not in the police headquarters, and I said, and I had to retain all the evidence that I could, and I said, I'm not going to give it to you because I don't trust you. You know, I don't trust your motives. My only motive is to find Danny, and you have other political motives that I don't have. Therefore, I, uh, you know, I'm more determined than you are. And, and uh, little by little, these people became men and women, you know, and then I think we all g get to the point where we felt like, you know, this is, this is like almost like two visions of the world fighting each other. One is, you know, promoted by Al-Qaeda and, and, and terrorism and this clash of civilization, and the other one is us. And in, uh, you know, at the end of, uh, of, 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 of a week, you know, what we had was, as I say, women and men and women fighting for the same thing. And the people who went out there, and, and I never knew whether they were going to come back or not, uh, you know, in the, in the morning were Pakistani, were, you know, were from, from... So trying to convey, which is very difficult, and to this day is very difficult, to convey the, the, um, the, the ground reality, you know, and, 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 and how everybody sees to become a label. A Muslim, or you know, we had everything. We had Jews, we had Muslims, we had Hindus, which doesn't not happen in Pakistan. It's very common in the U.S., but not over there. And and everybody was aware of that. And and I think everybody fought really beyond the call of duty because because all of a sudden it was beyond us. I mean, it was something bigger than than all of us. And I think obviously the fact that I was there, that I was pregnant, that I was you know, also helped because they wanted, uh, they understood what I was standing for. So I I convey that. To, to the president and say, well, you know, because it's not only like, uh, you know, guidelines and politics and intelligence, you know, there's a, there's, this is all men and women out there, and they're suffering, so. So when, when you look at your situation now relative to then, do you feel that there has been a tremendous amount of education, a lot of learning on the part of people, understanding about these issues that didn't exist as much then? Obviously, we have a long way to go, but... We have a uh, long way to go. I think the world has changed dramatically since then, and for instance, for journalists, you know, Danny was the first, like, in such a public way, journalist to be targeted as such, you know, and then that happened a lot more, and, and journalism changed. You couldn't cover things uh, the way you, you used to. You know, so the, the, the war in Iraq was embedded journalists. I mean, I had never heard of that before, you know, and so that really, really changed in a bad way, too, because the world became much more dangerous. I think that, you know, I think that now, you know, rem the, 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 the most difficult part of the, w the, the work remains because, you know, whatever way you look at it, it is the problem of, of ignorance that, that's bringing us where we are. And I think um, maybe it is by nature, intrinsically, that human beings are lazy and being, are, are afraid as well. We're afraid of difference. Yet I don't see how we can um, secure peace in the world if we don't um, uh, promote dialogue. And we don't, not only like dialogue as a nice idea, but, but um, personally, that's what I try to do as an individual. And I'm just an individual. I'm a journalist, I'm a mother, I'm whatever, you know. But, but what I, you know, even when I felt angry and I felt frustrated and I felt sad, I did not want to give up on, on, on dialogue, you know, and that has saved me very much so because, you know why? Because I, I'm not vulnerable to other opinions, you know, mm -hmm. or to the media, or to what the media is saying to me because I have my personal relationship. I have gone the extra mile to try to understand other perspectives and that, and that makes me strong. Because otherwise, you're vulnerable to fear. You're vulnerable to, you know, to you manipulate. You know, you can manipulate somebody who's afraid or is or is ignorant. Somebody who has had the experience, it's, it's harder. Mm -hmm. And I don't think I have been manipulated personally by 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 anyone, and, and less so by uh, by Al Qaeda terrorists. Mm -hmm. But the the challenge seems so big to the average person. But when we think about the perpetrators of these acts, they represent such a tiny percentage of a religious group or of a community or an eth ethnic group and so forth. And it, it seems that it, it's almost impossible to explain to the average person that th the threat relative to the overall population is, is quite small if we could just muster the support of the majority to help keep that minority in check. Yeah, I think like, uh, well, I think, you know, I guess it's different in different countries, but in Pakistan, for instance, when you say, you know, this is such a big country and so many people, why aren't the silent majority, you know, why mm. is it silent? And But we have silent majorities everywhere. Mm -hmm. And um, in Pakistan, you know, people are afraid, you know, they're afraid of the ISI, you know, ISI is quite uh, uh, tough uh, agency and they've done a lot of harm and so people are afraid and they know that 
if they speak up, they can disappear, they can, you know. But when I was in Pakistan, and after that happened, people actually led a campaign on the web with their names saying, you know, that that's not us, you know, don't, you know, we, we support you and we, uh, we just want to say that we don't want to stay, remain silent on that issue. This is not about us. But I also think that, you know, it is a tiny, um, politically, it's a very tiny part of, of, of the population. But I think that they are the extreme representation of an anger and a frustration mm -hmm. that's long lived, you know, that has been built for, uh, after years and years and years. And the same element that we all know, you know, have contributed to, to, to building that frustration, you know, the, the lack of employment, the lack of hope, uh, you know, all these things. And so, so they represent, they're like the, the visible tip of the iceberg, mm -hmm. you know, but that there, there is, you know, uh, underneath. It's not like an isolated um, lunatic who is going to put a bomb, you know, it's more that, it's more complicated than that. But I think the one thing they don't expect is dialogue. You know, they don't, there's one thing they don't, for me it was like that, it was felt like, well, you know, I, th I thought about what terrorists, m you know, meant to have take a, taken away from me and, I, and, and deny that. And I think that's a kind of effort, it's very, it's very hard, like even when I talk about that people think, you know, it's just crazy, <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> because how, you know, uh, or, um, or why, you know, it's like I'm blaming the victim, you know, I'm the victim, and I, I could be, I, I know all that, I could be li very legitimately angry, mm -hmm. or I could retreat, or I could mm -hmm. become, but I don't want to because that would be my defeat, you know, it really would be my defeat, you know, it would be the end of me, so whether I'm, I'm killed or not, I'd be dead in some ways, mm -hmm. you know, and so I think that, um, that, you know, the, the outreach of ordinary people is, is fundamental because, the, the, you know, if we think sometimes here, oh, we know, we, ignore, you know, we don't know enough, but in Pakistan, people don't know. Mm -hmm. And for instance, you know, an American for them, it's, you know, it's, it's uh, I mean, if you, uh, we, we did sometimes like with Danny, like talking, you know, with people, and then when they said, you know, they knew he was American, they're like, what? <laughs> you, you're American? I mean, mm -hmm. they couldn't believe. I mean, the level of ignorance is, is, is deeper, if I may say, than mm -hmm. anybody expects, you know. It's, it, it really is about education and, and reaching out, you know, mm -hmm. ordinary people, young people, that kind of things. Once you create that kind of link, it really changes in front of your eyes. So it works, but we have to put out, put out the mm -hmm. effort. Well, you've selected, obviously, the more difficult path because to, to be the victim, to retire, all of the other options that, that were there would have yeah. been a lot easier. Yeah. This is more difficult, but potentially yeah. it can have more benefits, especially if you succeed in this very important mission of, of educating. And, and as you said, the challenge in other places is, is, is significant, it's big but, it's, it, yeah. but it's, also, well. it's also big in this country. It's big and, in, the, in every and, country. And, in France, and, uh, it's big. In Spain, it's big. And, yeah. You know, it's, 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 uh, it's, a, it's, it's a human challenge. But I think, you know what, John, that I feel like we have done, you know, we have done so many revolutions. You know, we've done political, my, my mother's Cuban, so, you know, I grew up with this whole, whole thing about, you know, the revolution and then uh, in Paris, and so I wasn't <laughs> in Cuba, but, um, but you know, technological and information in my lifetime, the internet, you know, all that, you know, all these revolutions, but we, what we haven't changed is really our, uh, us, mm -hmm. the human revolution. We haven't done that. And I don't see why we should lose, lose our time in doing any other revolution and finding more means of communication if we don't change, if we don't enhance or if we don't um, capitalize on our humanity, I don't see where we're going to go. Mm -hmm. And for me, you know, having confronted very closely people that, for me, you know, terrorists are quite um, are quite savvy. They know, they know, they know people. They know how people react. They know the media, for instance. Mm -hmm. You know, they know the lack of self-control mm -hmm. that media can, you know, can show and all that. And then they use it. You know, so every everybody who's going to plant now an attack on them is going to do it for the evening news, mm -hmm. and the evening news is going to rush out. <laughs> you know, because they know how to do this kind of thing. So there's more introspection in some ways on the other side mm -hmm. than there is for us. And I think that you know, in a way, we have we're confronting. I mean, I'm talking about terrorism itself, but you know, we're confronting people with very determined, clear set of values and and ready to do anything to you know to 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 make them happen or to impose them to the world. So we are, in a way, challenged to have also very determined set of values and knowing what we're fighting for.
Mm-hmm. You know, we can really be vague in, you know, in confronting that kind of, of an enemy. So I, I do, I'm not a politician, you know, and I don't want to be either. Mm-hmm. And, uh, <laughs> and, uh, and I do what I can as a, as a, as a person, you know, mm-hmm. as just a, as a person. So what I, I, I try, you know, I don't know every day what it means, you know, I'm mm-hmm. like, I'm places like here, but I try to do that in my, you know, in my daily life. And that's hard, you know, mm-hmm. every day I have to remind myself to like not, you know, that, you know, everything is more complex than I would <laughs> sometimes mm-hmm. wish it to be. And I have this instinct of judging people that I don't know and then realize, thanks God I'm a journalist. Because at least I have to go the extra mile to uh, question my, my, mm-hmm. my quick judgments, you know. Mm-hmm. So. What do you feel is the best way to reach people to, to inform them? Uh, obviously, uh, through, through movies, films, documentaries, mm-hmm. uh, that's, an, that's an easy medium for mm-hmm. people rather than in the formal education process, but w- what about A Mighty Heart uh, that was made into a film? Do you feel that that had the impact that you desired? I think so, because um, I think it's a movie that that wasn't, and, and I'm happy about that, it wasn't a big commercial success, because for me it was very difficult to deal with all this, you know. I was trying to talk like I talked to you. Mm. I wasn't, you know, interested in anything else, and so, it was a little strange, you know, and um, and um, but I think it, it's it touched people, you know. I think it, it can. It, I I decided to do this to agree to to sell the rights of the book because the book is like at least I was alone. <laughs> I had no idea whether I was gonna, anybody was going to read that book, and I wrote it with my blood, you know, really. And uh, and Adam was even born when I when I when I started writing it, and I I just had to do something difficult. Mm. But mighty hard. But the film for like a year and a half, I said no, I can't do that. And and I, we had met with uh, with Brad Pitt, and and uh, and we get along really well. And I told him there's no way, <laughs> this is a bad idea. And, you know, and we but we we, we stayed. You know, we, we we were friends. And um, and after you know, it's when the country went to war in Iraq. Then I thought. I was so depressed because I felt like, okay, well, yeah, I know it's going to, I mean, everybody knows it's going to happen. Al Qaeda's going to move in. You know, war has never brought any solutions. I mean, this was, was wrong. And, I, and so I felt like, well, at least let's, let's do this film because it does give, you know, the, the film is about this team that I was mentioning before and, and, and how, you know, people from all over the world got to fight for Danny. So I, you know, I felt at least that will give people a human account, you know, with all, you know, amidst all the propaganda that we were hearing, because that was intense. You know, I was living in New York at the time. I was in the U.S. I was shocked, you know, and um, and I thought, well, you know, but it's just a drop in the ocean. I mean, I'm just a person, you know, and so, but I feel like, you know, I feel through the, the letters that I have, you know, that people uh, write me were very incredibly touching, and a lot of young people. And they write to me, and they, you know, they, uh, and, and from all countries and all origins and all everything, um, and the, and and I see that, you know, it's not a it's not a work of glory and fame, but the heart to heart, you know, if you you have to fight for it and to maintain it, but it it, it works, and you may never see it, you know, but somehow it works. So you have to have the humility of thinking, well, it's out there, you know, and that's that. Tell us a little bit about the second book. Uh, you, you write a column in that, that hope, yeah. underscores women's yeah. courageous movement and right. activities around the world. Yeah, I, I, uh, I wanted to resume my work as a journalist, and I, but the media had changed quite a lot, and I didn't feel like, you know, I felt like at this stage of my life, if I'm going to bring anything, I want to bring something that's, that, that, that's going to help people relate to one another. I don't want to just like uh, emphasize another, uh, you know, horrible. <laughs> Mm. And um, so I so, so I said, well, okay. So then, I, if I want to bring hope, where do I go? And, and then also, it was also a conversation with 9/11 uh, family victims, you know, victim family, sorry, uh, who said, you know, wh- there was 103 babies that were born after 9/11, uh, widows of uh, victims of, and Adam is 104th, okay. Right. And right. so, uh, and and these people said, well, what, what, what are we going to tell our kids? You know, what you, you know, the the, the, su- the search of hope was really dire. And I said, well, okay, let's, let me try. Let me go and try to find where I can find hope. And my training and my understanding of the world made me not uh, go and look for hope in, in things that um, traditional, like politics and, you know, I knew that, or, or, or religion, any of that, you know. I wanted to say, is, uh, do we have legitimate human beings that can, through their lives and through the example, can give us hope. 
And all I have to do is look for them. They're out there. There's a lot of incredible people out there. And that's the best we have. So that's what I did. I did a, and women. I chose women because I also think that women are more, you know, uh, are much more. They're doing so much more work. And they are uh, taking on so much lasting change and uh, in quiet and, you know, without the sound and fury, but they're doing incredible work. And, and I'm happy to say that, and it, you know, I wrote in the prologue, it's like, yeah, that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to search for hope. <laughs> Can you share one of the stories yeah, with us? I know they're all inspiring, but yeah, you could they, just pick yeah, one. Yeah, it's for instance, like a, we, uh, I, sh I share a couple with you because they're very different. But because the series go from a, like a cleaning lady in the in the suburbs of France to a president who's now a Nobel Peace Prize, mm -hmm. uh, Mrs. Uh, Johnson Sirleaf. And, uh, but one of the most dear uh, story to me is, uh, has to do with a child at the time. Now she's like 23, 24. And her name is Mayoli, she's in Colombia. And Mayoli um, had to, her best friend, uh, she lived in a really tough neighborhood in Bogota, and her best friend was shot right next to her, the, the next door. And uh, she saw that, and she saw that the, the, the adults around her, she was 15 at the time, that nobody reacted. There was not gonna be any justice, nobody's gonna look for, you know. And then she, 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 she realized that everybody had given up. And so what she did is uh, gather the children in her neighborhood in a little hall, I went there, so it's, it's just a hall on the ground, and they sat down there, and they, um, and she talked to them, and she said, you know, guys, you know, nobody's doing anything, we can't live like that, you know, and so they started doing this, like, informal think tank for children to discuss violence, and then they started realizing that, you know, all of them were confronting violence in their homes, so they said, well, let's try to talk to our parents and stop you know, beating us up and maybe we can stop. So they're starting this campaign against violence of children. And I went to the meeting and they, you know, they were from like five to maybe 14 or 15. And you see them like, you know, it's, it's incredible. Mm. And, and they've uh, ended up being nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize as well. Mm. You know, and it started it there. And so it's, that's my early. And, and, uh, and for me, it was a very strong story because I said, you know, when our children, little children, have to, you know, take over, the fight for some kind of peace, you know, and ending mm -hmm. violence. That means that we, <laughs> we really have gone far. And so I, I, you know, she's a very dear person to me because she's a very old, you know, she's just a, a kid from the neighborhood. Mm -hmm. She's not, a, you know, she doesn't have any interest in doing that. She just said, we can't give up. We can't just live like that. And your second example? And my second example is um, a lady who was a, was a cleaning lady, then in, uh, and she's a Moroccan origin and an uh, immigrant. And I grew up in France, so I know, and, and uh, with a lot of North African, we are my friend to this day. And I know their parents, I know their mothers, you know, this, it's a whole generation that never had a voice and that, you know, just was brought to France. And France is a quite a racist country, and, you know, and so all these people are there, but they're not really granted full citizenship or full respect, you know, you might say. And uh, she was one of them, and she, but, and she was gonna get taken out of school very early, and, uh, but she really wanted to learn literature. And so she had read Victor Hugo in Arabic, and she didn't know how to you know, speak French, and now write in French, as you could speak but not write. And then, um, so she started working as a cleaning lady for all these years, for 20 years, and nobody, and she said, I'm transparent. You know, she, nobody ever saw her and all that. So she started writing f phonetically poems. And uh, one day she had an accident, and somebody, just to make a long story short, that somebody helped her phonetically transcribe uh, those poems, and, uh, and she wrote and she published them. Oh. And it's, called, it's a book called Prayer to the Moon, and, and for the first time she talks about all these women and all this, you know, without a voice, you know, transparent, the transparent generation. And after I wrote this article about her, now the book is published in four countries, wow. in four different languages, you know, and she's a, a poet cleaning lady, so I think it's just po That's very poetic, very Wonderful. Yeah. Thank you so much for well, sharing. thank you. Thank, thank you, you for joining us thank today, Marianne much. Pearl. All right. And thank you. For the Global Perspective Show, I'm John Bercia. We'll see you next time.